Welcome back to the final part of Lecture 44 for Maths 1210 here. Uh, and we, we, we finished Section 5.1, and now we're going to move on and start in this lecture, Part 5.2, which will also be the entirety of the next Lecture 45, about uh, 5.2 here. We want to talk about the definite integral. We talked about previously about indefinite integrals, which is just a different name for antiderivatives. Uh, what is a definite integral? Well, when we have a function f and an interval a to b, we define the definite integral to be the area under the function f uh, as, as you go on the interval from a to b. So what do we mean by that? Um, so we've seen this object before. Uh, we saw this in some of the previous slides in section 5.1 here. So take the sum. So remember the sigma there means a sum. Take the sum where i goes from one to n of f of x i star times delta x. Now this f of x i star and this delta x, this is the length and width of a rectangle. The f of x i star is the length of the rectangle. The delta x is the width of the rectangle. So this f of x i star delta x is the area of the ith rectangle under the curve. If you add up together all the rectangles, uh, this thing gives us an approximate area under the curve. And this sum right here is called a Riemann sum, okay? And so in the previous in the previous lecture parts, especially in 5.1, we were calculating Riemann sums, these areas under the curves. Now those were just approximations of the area under the curve. As we had these functions and we look at these rectangles, right? The rectangles do an okay job at estimating the area under the curve, but there's always a little bit of error associated to them. Sometimes they overestimate, sometimes they underestimate, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the idea we also saw is that the more and more rectangles we use, the better and better they fit under the curve. The error gets smaller and smaller, the skinnier the rectangles get. So we want to use more and more rectangles to get better, better estimates. So, uh, you know, instead of using three rectangles, use 10. Instead of 10, use uh, 17. Instead of 17, use 3 trillion, right? You can keep on doing better and better the more rectangles you use. Well, what's the best number of rectangles to use? Well, that's where calculus comes into play here, that we can increase the, the accuracy by taking arbitrarily large number of rectangles. So if we were to take the limit as n goes to infinity, um, as each of these Riemann sums approximates the area of the curve, if we were to use an infinite number of rectangles, we could capture the true area, not an approximation, but we could capture the true area under the curve. So we take the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. And so the limit of the Riemann sum is what we define to be this definite integral. Um, we use the same notation we use for, for indefinite integrals with one small um, exception here. We're still going to have the integral symbol, which is this elongated s. We have our function f of x. This is what we're integrating, the integrand. We have this differential dx, which tells us what we're trying to integrate here, the variable. But you'll see these numbers a and b that tell you the start and stop of the interval there. So f is the function we're trying to find the area under. And the, the, this here tells us the lower, the left bound. This tells us the right bound. And you'll notice that this right here mimics the notation we saw in the Riemann sum, right? So we take f of x dx. Um, f, f of x there is the height of the rectangle. The rectangle's heights are determined by the function f. And the width of the rectangle is this dx here. The idea is this dx is this infinitesimally thin number, right? It's not zero because if you take f of x times zero, then... Uh, the area of a rectangle will be zero. Add a bunch of zeros together, you just get zero. But dx is supposed to represent this really wafer-thin rectangle, right? It's so thin that we can't even measure it. It's that thin, right? Uh, it's like a piece of paper, but even thinner than that. And so the area of a rectangle is going to be f of x times dx. f of x is the height of the function. dx is this infinitesimal number. Um, you, add, you get that product. That's going to be a really small value, but it has some positive area. And then we add them together. And this is why the integral symbol is a long S. Because S stands for sum, much in the same way that the sigma stands for a sum as well. And so this gives us what we call a definite integral. Why do we call it a definite integral? The other ones, the integers, indefinite integrals. And we'll see in the next section that definite integrals, which calculate the area under the curve, are related to the... Um, indefinite integrals, aka antiderivatives. 
And the previous uh, part of this lecture actually gives us a hint on what that connection is. Um, and I'll elaborate that a little bit more in the future. And so this, uh, we say that a function is integrable if this limit exists, because a, a definite integral is the limit of a Riemann sum. Limits might not exist. It depends on the function f. Um, now, if this limit exists, we say the function's integrable, and it doesn't matter how you choose xi star. Um, in terms of approximation, the xi star makes a big difference. When we were approximating pi, we saw that the midpoint rule was actually more accurately approximating pi than all the other approaches we had tried. And the midpoint rule does pretty good in practice. Uh, but when it comes to the limit, as you have infinitely many rectangles, it doesn't matter how you choose xi star. So in that case, we're typically going to choose xi star. For the sake of simplicity, we're going to choose it to just be a plus i delta x. That is, we're going to be basically using rn, the right endpoint rule, uh, when we do these things. But in the meanwhile, what I want you to understand, just, just for this lecture part right now, is that the definite integral represents the true area of the curve. And so let's look at some examples of that. If we have the, if we want to compute the integral from zero to four of the function two x dx, well, let's take a look at that function from them. Geometrically, what are we trying to do? So here's our x and y axis. We want to go from zero to four over here. And our function y equals two x. That's actually the that, that's the that function is a linear function y equals two x. It's a it's a function which goes to the origin. That's its y intercept, and its slope uh, would be two. Let me try that again. This is not going to be perfectly drawn to scale, but hey, I didn't give a really good scale down here, so who can tell, right? If I don't label the y axis, no one will ever know. But if this is our function y equals two x, I want you to notice that the area under the curve of this linear function is a triangle. And so we can, comp and it's actually a right triangle, is it not? Um, and so we can find the area under this curve by the traditional formula. That is to say, this integral from zero to four of two x dx, it is an area, it's the area of this triangle, which we could compute using the usual one half base times height formula. Now the base of this triangle um, is gonna be this distance right here. Um, it's the length of this side, which is from zero to four. So that length um, is itself gonna be four. So we get one half times four. Well, how about the height then? The height of the triangle is gonna be this distance right here. Uh, so how far above the x-axis do we go? Well, it depends on this point right here. Uh, this is the point whose x-coordinate is four and whose y-coordinate will then be eight, two times four. And so then the height of the rectangle is gonna be eight units. We'll put the, we'll put the base there as well. We have four units. Uh, and so then we end up with a eight right here. Well, one half of four is two and two times eight is 16. And so the area of this triangle is gonna be 16 square units. Um, that's the area under the curve and that is what this integral is calculating. This integral is equal to 16 because the integral calculates the area under the curve. Uh, here's another example. Let's evaluate the integral from zero to one of the function square root of one minus x squared dx. And so this is trying to calculate the area under the curve. This is the area, the area under the curve. And so it can be helpful to understand what does this curve look like. And our curve is actually going to look something like the following. So this right here is a function, which is a, it's a semicircle, right? Uh, to kind of see this, uh, if you take the unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1. Um, if you solve for y squared, you get y squared equals 1 minus x squared. If you then solve for y, you'll get plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. Um, choosing the plus gives you the upper semicircle, and choosing the minus gives you the lower semicircle. Um, so let us make that choice right there. And actually, I don't even I don't need the plus then either, I suppose. So we're going to choose the upper semicircle, which you now see on the screen. And if we want to go from zero to one, a zero, x equals zero is right here. X equals one is right there. We're trying to calculate the area of this region right here, which this is just a quarter circle. The area is going to equal one fourth 
pi r squared. Pi r squared is the area of the whole circle. We're taking a quarter circle right here. So we get 1 fourth times pi times the radius, which is 1. Uh, the area <coughs> under this curve is going to be pi fourths. And so that is the area, that's what the integral is equal to. So the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 minus x squared dx, this will equal pi fourths. And so this gives us some examples of integral calculations where the function coincides to a nice geometric region, which we already have a formula for. Um, stay tuned for the next lecture, uh, lecture 45, where we're going to talk about what do you do when the curve doesn't have a cute little geometric formula that we've seen in a previous class. How do you find the area of the curve there? Uh, and so, as always, please subscribe if you want to see more updates or you want to see more content like this one right here. Uh, leave a comment below if you have any questions. Like this video, and I will see you next time. Have a great day, everyone. Keep on calculating.